Good afternoon and welcome to everyone. I'm Rebecca Vieira and I'm the coordinator of the Inter-American Teacher Education Network, or I-10 for short, an initiative of the Organization of American States. I'm pleased to welcome you all to this webinar, one in our series of webinars, COVID-19 Teaching STEM in Quarantine. Before continuing, I'd like to briefly introduce I-10 to those of you who are not familiar with us. The purpose of I-10 is to improve the quality and equity of education through teacher education across the Americas. To do so, we offer funds and activities for educational leaders with the intent to resolve problems of policy and practice related to STEM teacher education, in which STEM refers to science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. To learn more about us and how to get involved, visit our website. The link will be shared at the end of the presentation. Given by teacher fellows and participants and supporters of I-10 project teams, this series of webinars objective is to support the efforts of teachers during this time of quarantine. Again, to join future webinars, please visit our webpage, which will be shared at the end of this presentation. This afternoon, we're pleased to have a presentation from Lynn Jorgensen, a distinguished high school physics teacher and I-10 teacher fellow from Gilbert High School in the state of Arizona in the United States of America. Her presentation will be under an hour and afterwards we'll have question and answers. During the presentation, you're welcome to ask questions using the Q&A tool. If you type your questions in the chat, we probably won't see them because there's lots of content always going through the chat. So make sure you use the Q&A tool. At the end of her presentation, Lynn will answer a select number of questions. This webinar will be recorded and the recording as well as the slides will be linked to the I-10 COVID-19 webinars webpage. In approximately 24 hours, you will receive a notice that the recording has been uploaded and that same message may serve as evidence of your attendance should you need to show it to your administrators. Additionally, we'd like to express our gratitude to the Educational Portal of the Americas, which is providing support to transmit this presentation live via their Facebook page, and most especially to our donor, the US Mission to the OAS. At the conclusion of this webinar, please lastly do not forget to complete the brief survey that will be helpful and um, helpful for us to determine future webinars. All right, so thank you very, very much for coming. And now I will pass the presentation over to Lynn. All right, thank you guys for joining us today. I'm gonna to go ahead and share my screen here in a second. I'll introduce myself a little bit. Um, I have been teaching for five years. Um, I've been teaching for five years um, at the same high school. I came in my first year. Um, many of you have had experiences like this, maybe not quite this dramatic. Um, I was hired two days before school started my first year. And I was pretty much thrown into a classroom with some books and equipment that I didn't know how to use. A lot of it was outdated and I had to kind of survive the first year. My second year teaching, I tried to fix some of the things. I'm like, well, that didn't work right. And those first two years were about survival and adjustments. My third year teaching, I realized I was missing something. I was spending too much time lecturing. My students weren't getting the purpose of the labs. Um, they just would prefer to do a cookie cutter lab and not have to think and do on their own. And so I really wanted to work on finding a way that my students had some more accountability in what they were doing and to help them better understand the process of what we were doing. Um, I came to ASU um, is a big university right out here, but next to us, Arizona State University, and they have worked very closely with other um, other institutions and have developed a modeling program where students learn and model the process of what they're doing. It's very inquiry based. They're doing labs. They're developing the um, equations and the process behind those labs. It's all backed by massive amounts of research. Um, this idea of inquiry based and modeling based um, activities um, where the teacher ends up being more of a guide and we provide context to what they're doing. Um, and so we'll make sure that we have on the end of our slides, we'll make some links on there for you guys if you're interested in that. But in the last two years, since I have been taking modeling classes and working on my master's degree with ASU, I've seen huge improvements with my students and their understanding, understanding and context of what we're doing. Um, and so that's been a really big deal for us. So what we're gonna be presenting, what I'm gonna be presenting to you today is um, an optics 
the optics unit essentially that I did with my students remotely. Um, I picked optics because it was the next unit for my regular students. My AP1 students, um, we had to finish simple harmonic motion for them to be able to take the AP exam, which we all have our own thoughts and feelings of. Um, my AP2 students needed all of magnetism and induction. Um, so I had to do a, quite a bit of uh, getting everything together to get some remote learning activities going. Um, the optics stuff um, has worked really well, and I'm going to go ahead and start sharing some of the stuff in our slides with you guys on that. Um, and we'll be talking around a little bit on there. Um, like many of you, I just recently learned how to do webcasts and screen um, Zoom meetings, and our school in particular um, is a Cisco system. That's our phone system, so we use WebEx. Um, there's Google Meets, there's lots of things, and just like many of you, we've all learned how to do it in a very short amount of time. As I said, we're going to be focusing more on optics. Um, that's going to be the main focus of what I'm going to talk about and how we're going to do things. However, all of the things we're doing, all of the ideas and the principles behind them work for any, any science class and at any level. The idea of presenting an activity for someone to do, and then we giving the teacher giving context and direction to that activity. The students then having a discussion about the activity, and then having to apply that activity to new situations and scenarios. Um, that's very much a big part of what modeling is about and what inquiry-based is about, and it puts the onus onto the students. And so we're gonna go through and look at some of the things that I did with my classes. Um, to help and see if that helps give you guys some ideas as well. I don't know what the fall is gonna look like, none of us do, and so I'm kind of making some plans ahead of time. Um, so today's focus is gonna be on optics. We're gonna look at those. We're gonna look at some ray diagrams, shadow formations, pinhole cameras, plane mirror lab, reflection and refraction. That's about as far as I got in the seven weeks or so that we had, um, we were given two weeks at the beginning to kind of get things together before we started teaching. So that really took about a, a good a chunk of time for all of our students there. So this is all about an augmented approach to learning. That students are gonna do an activity. They're going to make observations. They're going to take measurements. They're going to make rough diagrams on their own. They're gonna do stuff and be held accountable for doing some things on their own. Um, now, they email me their observations, um, and I'm gonna talk about how I communicate with students here before we get into the lessons too far. They email their observations, so I know ahead of time of how to direct the lesson, the actual discussion portion. In our webinar format, we'll discuss their observations. I use drawing tools to explain both the why things happened and how it happened. And students are then gonna do relevant practice work to apply the activity and discussion. Each activity builds upon the other. Now, when I talk about students emailing me my observations or emailing me their observations, we do a couple of things, and I don't know what other schools are. Our school is a Google school, so we use, this is called Google Classroom, and I can assign stuff up here in Classwork, and it also allows students to submit their work. Clearly, this was at the very last assignment for my AP students. Only five people got around to it. It allows me to hook link into Google Calendar and share files with our drive. I also use this wonderful free app called Remind, and it's really simple, it's remind.com. And I'm able to send really short notes and messages to my students. They're also able to make responses back directly to me. And so see, these are some of the ways that we use to communicate. And they had already been in place before remote learning started. Um, and so my students were already used to knowing where to look for things and how to look, and we relied on them a lot more after we went into our remote learning formats. Um, and then we used for our remote learning, we have been, as I said, our school used WebEx. Zoom is the one we're all using right now. They all have the same thing, the ability to share screens, the ability to share videos, the ability to whiteboard collectively as a class. There are chat functions and features that I use to to keep tabs on my students and ask questions in the middle of discussions to make sure people are still there and listening and didn't just walk away from their computers. 
So for shadow formation, um, essentially you need an uh, some sort of object. Um, you need some sort of object. You need a flashlight and our ruler. And our class, um, we have Paddington Bear is kind of the theme. He's a mascot of our class. He comes along to lots of stuff. So I pulled Paddington Bear out and we talked about him. With the materials list, I tend to have some handwritten notes with things. Let me scroll down. And I will upload, handwrite this out, scan it in or take a picture of it with my phone. And I'll upload this to Google Classroom. So my students then, as I'm verbally explaining things, they also have a written copy of what we're doing and how to measure and what we're looking for as we go through. So for shadow formation, it's really simple. And this is a great thing to do with younger kids. It's a great thing to do with older kids. It actually applies and works across all of the age groups very nicely. But you need an object, a flashlight, and some sort of ruler. And there's Paddington in the flashlight for us. With most of my activities, I go over, I made a nice one for you guys, but I go over my student expectations of what I expect them to be able to take measurements on. Um, since we're not in a classroom to be able to actually talk about it, I give them a little bit more direction than I would normally in a classroom because they don't have the same opportunities and I can't see their faces to know how much they don't understand. But essentially, we're gonna take a light source we're gonna put an object in front of the light and it's going to cast a shadow. I have my students measure the distance to the source and the distance to the shadow, and they're gonna measure the object height and the shadow height. I wanna see measurements on this. So this is going to be both a qualitative and a quantitative activity. So that's what I expect them to do before they come back in. So we would have a short webinar, a short check-in of, hey, here's what the introduction, we're gonna do this activity. And in this particular case, I introduced two activities at the same time, this one and the next one. I give a little bit of information about it, and then I have them work on that between the first webinar and then the next day. So they have two to three days um, to be able to work on that, and we come back and work. From there, we have a class discussion lesson. There are lots of ways to be able to do these lessons and these online ones. You can use uh, the whiteboarding technique that's on the classroom. I like to share my screen and I'm gonna show you what I particularly use. I use this one, it's called a smart notebook. You can also do it with publisher. I like this one because I can draw shapes and there's a pen tool and I can write and draw and share things with my students. So I will use a snipping tool and take a screenshot of what we're gonna be talking about and using. And then I, um, once I get everything back, there we go. And then I use one of those images to talk about our lesson. So in this case, we've got an object and we have a light source. And from there we talk about how light, how light forms. And I'll use the drawing tool to say, hey, this is a light source. And from light sources, we get an infinite amount of light. And if you were to take the cap off of a flashlight and just look at the bright bulb, even though it would hurt your eyes, it would look to your eye like there are all of these tiny little light rays shining off of it. And that's kind of what's happening. Now there's an infinite number of light rays coming from any light source. And we use this to talk to them about how to draw light rays. They travel in a perfectly straight line. They leave the source perpendicular and travel in a straight line. And in this case, they're going to travel in a straight line and hit an object and then Here's another one and it's gonna hit. And another ray and it's, it's gonna hit. This light ray right over here misses the object and it hits the wall behind it. We talk about how shadows form. And this is actually a really important piece of optics. If students don't understand how shadows form, they're not going to understand how light rays travel and how we can get images with mirrors, with lenses, with any of the other things. So this first lesson is actually it's as simple as it is. The discussion of this lesson is one of the most important things for optics because it's they know it in their head. They know that, hey, something's gonna block the light and we get a shadow, but they don't always understand why. So we talk about how no light rays are going to fill, fill this area here. We get a void, which means we're going to have a shadow. And so we use that to talk a little bit about those things. We then take that discussion and have them apply it to their notes and what they did for their shadows. 
just like with our light source before, we have a light source, it hits their object, and some of the light misses the object and they're going to get a shadow. So I want them to learn how to draw ray diagrams properly. Essentially, you put a ruler on a piece of paper and trace a line. That light is going to travel in a perfectly straight line. So we have no shadow here, a shadow here because no lights are going to hit right here. And I have them. I know there's a lot more to shadows and ray diagrams and light intensity than this simple ratio. But in the context of remote learning, I can't cover every single thing in perfect 100% detail to make sure that all of my students understand it. So I'm hitting most of it. I'm getting about 80% of what I would have liked to have taught with optics um, to make sure that they have a conceptual understanding. And then next time when they see it again, we can go into a more depth and but greater detail. So I want them to get used to taking measurements and looking for ratios, that ratios are gonna be a huge part of what we do. Ratio of the distance to the source and the distance to the shadow, and the ratio of the object height to the shadow height. Those are probably the two most important things for them to be able to measure from here. Then from there, we go into an application. Um, these are two applications I'm gonna share with you guys that actually have come from ASU's modeling. What I like about them the most is this is not a cookie cutter thing. And notice these two examples. They're all based on the lab and the activity that we just did, but they're asking other questions. Not a question of an activity that they just did, but based on the activity that you just did, what would happen if? So in this particular one, draw a number of rays from the source, meaning what if, instead of having one object, you had three objects here and light could pass through two sections. What would the shadow look like? So they'll have to apply this in a different way than we had in our discussion. They're going to have to think a little deeper and a little more about a really simple idea. But this depth of question is what really turns this into an inquiry based from just, hey, let's shine a flashlight on Paddington Bear and see his shadow. And then another question of meaning, if we have two light sources, what's going to happen to it? And then we give them a brief reading on light rays because it's the very first activity and lesson and we need them to really understand light rays are gonna travel in a straight line and what's gonna happen there. So from there, our next activity, as I said, I introduced both shadows and pinhole cameras the same day. I love pinhole cameras in my classroom. When we do it in my classroom, I have five different shaped light bulbs set up around the classroom and they're gonna take through, go through. But pinhole cameras are a great one. I especially focused on labs and activities that my high school students could do with younger siblings at home. If they were babysitting or helping their parents out, they could engage everyone in the house in these activities. It's a really simple thing. You need a paper towel tube, aluminum foil, rubber band, um, I could not get into my classroom until this past Friday. I have not been in my classroom since the beginning of March, since we left for spring break. And so I picked out activities that I also had all the equipment for at home. And if I had this equipment, most of my students would have the equipment as well. Like for the first one, something and a flashlight. Everyone has a flashlight. Um, in this case, paper towel tubes, aluminum foil, now everyone has rubber bands, but most people have a younger sister or a brother or someone around the house that has hair elastics. So I used hair elastics because that's what we have at our house. And wax paper is a hard one to come by for this. I don't have wax paper at home. I have a ton of school. But what I did have at home was cereal. Cereal bags are a fairly opaque kind of plastic. And if you layer two or three squares of cereal bag on top of itself, you get the consistency of wax paper, where light, you can sort of see the shape on there, but it doesn't let all the light through. So that was kind of my fix on that one. And again, with this, I have a description and a visual for them as well, that they're gonna have foil, cardboard tube, my amazing drawings, my students have gotten used to them. And the super important part of this, poke a small hole in the foil with a pushpin. That's why it's called a pushpin camera. And yes, for you guys, if you've never built one, you can use paper towel holder tubes, you can use um, toilet paper tubes, you can use um, PVC pipe, it needs to be a little thicker. The key is that hole needs to be very small. So you can either use a push pin, 
you can use an earring backing. That's actually going to give you a small enough hole. Um, you can use the tip. This will be a slightly bigger hole, the tip of a, um, a mechanical pencil or the lead from there. But it needs to be a small hole. And I just very briefly demonstrate to them how you hold the small hole up towards a light source. And I asked them on their student observation expectations to draw their light source. And then I wanted them to draw the image as they saw it on the other side of the tube, that they had some sort of light source here, the hole is pointing to the light source, and they need to draw exactly what they saw. And then I asked them, why do you think this happened? So I've told them they will see something, but I don't tell them what they're gonna see. And I'm asking them to start making some, based on the shadow activity, why do they think that happened? And he's asking questions of why they think things happen is kind of really important and crucial with what we do. It's not just, all right, here's a lab, do it. Good job, you got some points. We want them to really think their way through and make these points as they go across. So then for our classroom lab discussion lesson, I actually had all of these images prepped on the, um, I drew all of these, this wonderful, amazing um, light bulb there for you. I drew it on the, um, that app that I showed you. You can also hand draw these out on a piece of paper and take pictures of them with your phone and upload them one at a time to your computer so you can just go through them as a slideshow for them. You can use Google Publisher or Microsoft Publisher. Um, you can use a drawing tool. If you have a tablet, you can just draw on it. There are lots of ways, both high tech and low tech, to do these discussions. And so from here, we go back to, this is the first slide where, hey, back to the other one. We have light rays coming off the light bulb. And I kind of really stressed to the high school kids, because it's silly, that the way they drew um, the sun when they were in kindergarten is probably the most accurate description that they could have for light rays. When they're little kids and in kindergarten, you know it's the sun because it's a yellow round circle with these light rays coming right off of it. So I told them they already knew physics in kindergarten and we just have to help them remember it a little bit better. So we talk about light rays coming off here. And if there's an infinite number of light rays, these are our light rays, then there could be one light ray from the very top of the bulb that travels in a perfectly straight line through this hole and it just keeps traveling in a straight line. And if there's a light ray from the top that made it through the hole, then maybe there's a light ray from the bottom that makes it through the hole and it travels in a perfectly straight line. And then lo and behold, the light ray that was at the top before is now at the bottom. And the light ray that was at the bottom before is now at the top. And that's why they get this kind of upside down image. So we're building on itself from there. And then this would be the final class discussion. I asked my students to help summarize this and explain to me what we're seeing and what we're doing. And then I type it up nicely for them. So we get an inverted image. And then I really stress the point that this is a real image because two light rays actually traveled and formed it. So this is our class consensus down here that pinhole cameras allow light to travel through them in a straight line and we get an inverted image. That those two activities take them five to 10 minutes on their own, maybe, maybe 15 to 20 if they're trying to figure out um, how to get a better image on their, uh, their pinhole camera, but they don't take very long. And you're gonna notice our classroom discussion between both of those takes maybe 15 to 20 minutes tops for both of those activities. Students on screens have less attention than they do in class. We cannot expect them to do everything that we would have done in class. We can't expect them to have the same attention span in class. I don't have the same attention span on a computer. I can't expect them to have that same one. So as we go through this, I've consolidated things I best, as best I could to maximize the time with my students. And then we go through an application. And again, I pull up a thing of here's another view of what we were doing. That we've got a light bulb with a pinhole and a screen. And reminding them that light comes from the top, travels through the screen to the bottom. Light travels from the bottom through the screen and ends up on top. 
And that application comes in with another worksheet that I used from, from ASU. Again, it's the similar one here, but then the question comes back in. If your screen is here, what happens if you move your screen closer to the pinhole? Meaning instead of using a paper towel tube like this, what if you used a toilet paper tube that's this size? And what if you moved your screen back so you had two paper towel rolls maybe taped together to make the screen? What's going to happen to the image? I encourage them to go back and test things with their pinhole camera, draw it out, answer the questions on the worksheet, draw it out, but then go back and test it to see it in action and not just kind of, they need that verification on there. From there, we go on to a plain mirror pre-lab simulation. And this pre-lab activity is actually from the physics classroom. I love this activity. I want to show you guys some of the, if you haven't used the physics classroom before, they've got wonderful tutorials, wonderful interactions. The tutorials can really be used for any age group, just like with step simulations. These tutorials are fantastic. This one has a part one and a part two, and you can expand things out. How do light rays reflect and how do images form in plain flat mirrors? And I have them go through these and it's like, hey, they're really simple and it gives a description of what's happening as they go through. Because I'm not in the classroom and I don't have a laser and it's hard to show that at any rate on Google as we go through this, it's hard to show those things. I rely on simulations to help beef up what they're doing. These are what some of the observations that one of the students sent back to me. And these are just his. His is actually a little fuller than some of the other students that they sent them back, but they he used a Google Doc and shared it with me. Other students just typed it up in an email. Um, and I had a couple students um, use the Remind app and a couple other, uh, or the chat function in Google Classroom to talk with me about that. This is a fantastic Plain Mirror Lab. Plain Mirror Labs are wonderful because everybody has a mirror in their house somewhere. The big bathroom mirror, a small mirror, they have a mirror that they can use. Um, the link of the lab I use is on here in the slide, it's embedded in. It's not my lab. This is a lab, like all teachers, um, I found a lab that was great and it was well done and nicely diagrammed out and I use it. Um, it's actually from the University of Virginia. It's a great one, but really they just need a piece of paper, a mirror, an object, and a ruler or a protractor. And you can even side set this with a small piece of paper and they fold it to see if it matches the, the, the angles match up. Protractors are fine and easy to do. If they have a smartphone, there's a protractor app. If they don't have a smartphone but have access to um, a printer, they can print off a protractor. There are, there are lots of low tech options for them on these. Now, most students do not have an individual super wonderful small flat mirror of their own at home, but they do have a bathroom mirror. And so the only adjustment to this lab that I make from being at school versus at home, I have them fold this piece of paper in half and put the piece of paper folded in half right up next to the mirror and use it from that form. Again, I give the student expectation. We talk a little bit about what I expect to see. That essentially, there's going to be an object over here, and they're going to look at it from over here. And I just want them to take a pencil and stick it, make a little dot where they saw the object in the mirror. And then afterwards, they're going to trace lines out. And these are, this is the class discussion we have had off of it, meaning we're going to have a light coming in and a light coming out. So these are the lines I expect to see before we get to our lab when we get to things. So we'll have, they're going to look at it from one angle and then they're going to move to a different angle. Object stays in the same place the whole time. They're going to move to a different angle and they're just going to mark. I want to see these first two lines, the view to the mirror on both of these. These are some two students examples. Legos work great. They stand on their own. And if you look at this, he's left his Lego here. This line means he was looking down here into the mirror. And if you follow this line back, those of you who know what's coming, it matches exactly up with the Lego. This view right here as he's looking along matches exactly right back up with the Lego. Another student didn't have a mirror that was easily accessible, so he used the side of his computer. 
um, again, Legos are popular. This is Darth Maul. He's looking at the thing, and if you follow this path, we hit Darth Maul from this line, and if you follow this second line here, we hit Darth Maul from this second line. Plane mirror activities work so well, they are really hard to mess up. Typically, when we do this in class, I have a big bag of M&Ms, and I give everybody a scoop, and they'll put the M&M on the spot, and then they eat the rest of the M&Ms while we do the lab. But these kids are using Legos, and it works really well. For class discussion, we then talk with them about how to draw the line back to the object, and the line back to the object, and I also talk about, tell them to unfold their piece of paper and continue that line as a dotted line on the other side of where the mirror was. And we get this other side of the mirror, and what they notice is, both from the reflection of the object in the mirror, and as we're doing uh, this discussion here, that the object distance, the distance that their Lego guy to the mirror was, it's the exact same distance that it looks like that it is behind the mirror. Meaning if you're standing a foot away from the mirror, you look on the other side, your reflection looks like it's standing a foot behind the mirror. Um, and we talk a little bit about looking at the angles. I ask them questions about what do you notice about the angles with my protractor set up here. And these angles here and these angles here. And they're gonna notice that the angles are gonna be the same. The angle that the object, the light comes in and the angle coming out are going to be identical. And that's really the big stress we want to have them get from these is that the distances are gonna be the same and the angles are going to be the same. We do a class activity. This is an actual simulation of a class activity. I have my students turn their chat function on and we go through this and ask them questions now. Like here's Alan over here and based on angles and light traveling a straight line, who can Alan see? And it's a great little simulation where it goes through all these people and you can test it out. So Alan, I'm gonna show you guys this. He's over here and if I trace his line, I'm gonna get this line over here. So down three, down three. Alan looks like he'll be able to see Ellie and those angles look like you're gonna be about the same. So the simulation goes through and shows you, great, you matched them up. So I have all of my students um, guess, make an educated guess on that first one. And it does that first simulation for them. We use the chat function. And when I get a chunk, I'm not gonna get all my students responding. And I know I'm not. Um, I aim for third to a half. If I have third to a half of my students responding to the chat, uh, then I think I'm doing a pretty good job on this. Um, not everyone has access, not everyone can, so we, we, we adapt where we can on there. And then we have them go through that. From there, they're going to do a practice um, worksheet, which is um, a really similar one. I found this great practice worksheet. It takes them through similar to what we just did, and then the worksheet moves all the people around. So they're not in a straight line, and then how they're going to see on here. This is where we start relying a little bit more on technology because I don't have a laser at my house. They're all at school, um, but I do have a flashlight. So I have them go through Snell's simu simulation law, Snell's law simulation on FET. Um, and then we talk about how to use a flashlight with a slit, meaning put tape or paper over the top of the flashlight to make a thin slit on there. Most people have water. Um, and food color coloring and a plain mirror. Not everyone has a small one, but we do our best on there. There are ways to mimic and do some of the simulations. If you take a flashlight um, and put a really thin slit on it, if you don't have a laser, this mimics it pretty well. And food coloring into water, highlighter ink into water, milk into water, gives enough particulates in the water that you can actually see the light traveling through. And so this is something I have them do and work on. After they've done this activity, I encourage them to play around, is what I tell them. Play around with this activity, this simulation. Um, I tell them just to stick on the intro and play around with it and see what happens if we shine things off and they can adjust everything through and there's a protractor. So we want them to play around with it first and see what happens. And then here are some cool images we talk about that I present to them and I said, show them these images after they've done some of the simulations and I ask them what do they think is going on? The light's traveling through a straight but this one's not quite straight and it becomes all of these shapes happening in here. 
So the class discussion, we use a couple of things. Um, I use, again, the physics classroom has a refraction simulation. I have a lot of tabs open here. Um, and there are interactives, and then there are activities. Um, one of the nice things about the, phys about the physics classroom, it has teacher notes that go along with everything as well. And so on here, again, we can extend it. You can shoot the laser. Sorry, the screen's up in the top here. You can move the laser around. You can move the laser underneath. You can change the materials. You can do all this stuff. And because of the chat bar at the top, I can't actually get to the start button for the laser. Um, but you can actually move everything around and we'll be able to use that as a discussion. We have the kids move things around. I actually open the sharing settings and let them manipulate things um, so that we can talk about it as we go. This is, I don't know if anyone's, I only discovered this app recently. It's called Apps on Physics. Um, and they have got really great things and all of their stuff is all translated into other um, languages as well. But you can adjust things, air and water, changing your index of refraction um, and changing your index of incidence. So I can actually here hand type things in and it's going to change the angles and we'll see our angle in and our angle out. This is a great um, function and feature. In fact, I used some stuff they had for my civil harmonic motion lesson. They had some wonderful things on there. It was really great. But those are two of the things I used to help with the classroom discussion because I can't have lasers up on my class, my chalkboard for them to talk about and see. And these are what our, uh, sorry, our, our discussion ends up looking like that we, based on what they said, we've got light traveling in, light traveling out at the same, um, at the exact same angle on both sides. That's what they saw from the play mirror lab. It's the exact same thing. It carries over with it. However, light inside bends at a different angle. We get some light in here bending at a different angle. And that's all I really need them to get from those activities that light inside the material bends at a different leg angle than the light does as it reflects. And then we talk a little bit about angles. That this is the law of refraction. We get reflection up here at the top and we get light refracting, that it's bending as it goes through. Um, depending on the level and how much time I want to spend on this, I can introduce Snell's law to them for those older kids, that n1 sine theta 1 is equal to n2 sine theta 2. I don't want to hit exit on there. And we go through there. Then we introduce this idea of critical angle because we saw something like this. And if kids haven't seen an aquarium before, then I show them a picture. If they haven't been swimming before, I encourage them at that point to go and get a glass of water, fill it up really high, and then look at the water from underneath and tell me what they see. Most of them are going to say it looks a little silvery. This is a great critical angle activity put together by the Exploratorium from San, out of San Francisco in California. It's a really simple one, it's where the pictures came from, of using a flashlight and shining it in. Um, they use a rectangular aquarium. This will also work with glass Pyrex dishes or a glass of water. Um, just needs to be clear for light to shine through. And we talk about and look at why does this happen? So this is a, love, a really nice activity that students can do and it gives a nice description of what's happening as they go through as well. Um, and then we talk about how this is similar to light shining into it. We're gonna get that same lights coming in, it's gonna hit and bounce back. We get this internal reflection and sometimes we get refraction. But sometimes we don't get refraction, and that's what we call that critical angle. There's an angle that light just can't escape from. And this even shows up in movies. A lot of little kids will understand this and see this. They're like, hey, light can't bounce out. That's why the fish see their reflections in the aquarium. Nemo and all of his friends are there, noticing that they can see themselves in the mirror, in the reflection of the aquarium as they go. So this is an application that we use to kind of tie it all together. Um, it's an interactive lecture demonstration from the University of Oregon. You can look them up. This link is in here embedded in the slides. 
they have made all of their interact interactive lecture demonstrations um, free um, this summer because of the remote learning, because of the pandemic. They've actually been trying to make sure students have these opportunities. This is where we kind of go through. Students can download a prediction sheet. Not every student has the ability to print things, and a lot of my students didn't. So they did rough, hand drew out some things. Um, their their ideas and then took a picture and emailed me those hand drawings and that was fine too. What's nice about each of these is they can click to see if they made the right prediction. Test it out first and then click to see. Demonstration three goes back to that bending of light simulation. So they're going to have some really clear descriptions of things to do. But each of these has a check your results on them. And it's a really nice thing. They worked really hard on this. Um, all of these demonstrations as they go through to make sure students are getting depth to these activities. We didn't get to all of these things. These are some of those other things of, oh, I'd like to do these. There are a lot of activities. You can Google them using water prisms, so a glass full of water, and what's going to happen if you shine um, a flashlight through there and getting prisms. You can do color mixing with light. Um, uh, this amazing group with Arizona, um, Dinell, um, Oh, Danelle, I just totally lost your last name. Sorry. <laughs> so what happens in your life? Um, has been working hard. She and Carmen have got a great set of activities going with color mixing. FET has a wonderful color mixing app on there. Curved mirrors, and you can talk about how curved mirrors follow the same ideas. Flat mirrors, except for that perpendicular line is going to travel and move with the mirror as it goes. Lenses then tie in with um, reflection and refraction and how that works. And then prisms and rainbows. Those are always kind of fun. Everybody loves rainbows. This is a great, Physics Central is another great one on there. Creating your own rainbow using um, a flashlight and a mirror and some paper. That this will also work if they don't have um, a prism at home to be able to make rainbows and talk about rainbows there. It's a great way to talk about those. So that, I'm going to stop sharing with you guys, is, wait, I have to go like this, there we go, slightly different than WebEx, but I have to figure out where the buttons are in here. So that's what we have done, what I have done in, in my classroom to help keep a unit, most of a unit. The real key with remote learning as we go through this first round, we can't get everything. It's just not possible. We're not going to get effort to be able to hit every point that we would love to have hit. We have to make these concise and really work with that idea that the students don't have the ability to sit you know, or be in our classroom the way they usually are. And so we work really hard on that. Um, my original plan this summer, because I have students who are absent, they get sick and then they miss a lab and they do things. My original plan this summer was to go into my classroom once a week to escape, maybe escape my own children. I just needed a break from them. Um, but to go to my own classroom and, <laughs> and film me doing an actual lab, one good example of a lab um, that they, my students could then use to take data from. And that would allow them to get caught up on labs without me having to have students come in at lunch or come in after school or come in before school, that we were going to work on that. Um, and now with this idea of remote learning and not knowing what the fall is going to look like, um, I think it's even more important that we kind of make plans of how can we accomplish the task and job that that lab did without them there, being able to talk about it with each other and with us. How can we keep that, that inquiry going when we're at not there asking them questions like we usually do? And so this is one take on how to add questions and add inquiry when they're at home doing stuff on their own. So thank you guys for listening. Thank you so much, Lynn, for, for sharing your experience. And I think perhaps most importantly, helping us to understand what a learning sequence might look like through online learning. Um, you shared some wonderful resources. And I put, um, uh, ITEN has put together a list of about 300, more than 300 um, resources for teaching STEM online, which I shared in the chat. And a handful of those also have translations, as you mentioned. So I hope people will um, find those to be very useful. So um, we do have a number of questions. 
Um, some people have posted in the Q and A. Um, I also want to share if anybody wants to post a question in Spanish, um, I can translate it for our speaker. We don't provide full translation for webinars. We have some webinars in English, some webinars in Spanish. But if you don't feel comfortable writing the question in English, you can write it in Spanish and get a response from, from Lynn. All right, so Lynn, um, one of the first questions we have is, have you tried using YouTube videos to explain the procedures for your students in a more explicit manner? Um, no, although in the future I might. Um, I did everything live via WebEx or I did a screencastify. So I filmed myself talking it over with them and then made that link available on our Google Classroom. Um, so not quite on YouTube, but I did film and go through live with my students and I allowed them to ask me questions as we talked about it. Um, it was all recorded and then I posted that recording onto our Google Classroom. So anyone who wasn't there that day they didn't miss out. They had everything and every opportunity that every other student had. Great, thank you. Um, and then there are a number of people who are asking questions about sub, you know, substitutions of materials. So for example, perhaps students don't have a flashlight, but they might have a phone that has mm -hmm. a, a lamp on it. Um, does that work just as well? Or um, I, people are also curious to know if you've tried things other than using liquid, um, liquid using water as your liquid. Um, you know, do you encourage your students to make substitutions and how do you deal with it when students don't have the exact materials you're asking them to use? Um, all of the stuff is adaptable. So yes, the phone will work. It just doesn't have the same distance. So they're going to need to do everything and shrink it down a little bit on there. Um, not everybody has a good light bulb to do with the um, pinhole camera, but those who don't usually have matches around their house and someone can light a match and hold a match and they can get an inverse image there. I've actually done the critical angle with Jello. It works really well. Um, Jello works nicely, but most people have water. Most people have a clear container of some sort. Um, Ziploc bags work really well as a clear container to shine light through. And that can be filled with a fair amount of water as well. So yes, I encourage them. There's never penalty for it's not exactly like I told you. I want them to get the, the theme behind it and the main purpose behind it, not could you follow my cookie cutter instructions? Okay. Um, we also have a question. You've mentioned modeling instruction and modeling materials and you've mentioned ASU. So are those materials available for optics through ASU? They don't have a lot for optics. Um, they have some for light. Um, most of the modeling stuff is from the, Kelly, I know you're on here, the American Modeling Teachers Association website. Um, and before Rebecca puts the, sl the slides live um, and makes the link available for you guys, I will make sure that I put the link um, onto theirs. So all of these things I showed you, those links are active, but I'll make sure that we put the link in for the American modeling. Yeah, Kelly just put it in chat on there. We'll make sure that that video, that that link for the American Modeling Teachers Association is on there. They have resources for physics, they have resources for chemistry, they have resources for biology, um, for just STEM fields. They have hundreds of resources. Great, thank you. Um, Let's see, on that note, we have many different types of teachers on here today. Um, and so somebody is asking, um, like the physics classroom interactive is quite interesting. Do you know of any interactive classroom materials for biology? FET. FET will have has stuff for biology. FET has stuff for chemistry. They are perfectly acceptable for preschool and elementary school up to high school. FET is the one that has something for everybody. Um, I know there, I'm sure there are ones out there for others, but I use the physics ones for those ones too. Great. Um, we have a question about when you do the online lessons, are you doing them live or are they in the form of some kind of recorded video and documents? Yes. <laughs> yes is the answer to that. Um, I do some of them for my, like for my physics classes, there was going to be so much detail involved I actually recorded those previously 
had them watch those pre-recordings and then we talked about it um, again as a class because the details were so specific. Um, I knew that if I messed up, it's hard to fix that. Um, simpler ones, I do live and record them and then I post those recordings. Um, we have a question here. Uh, she's, uh, uh, Emily says, thanks. For, uh, thank you for your ideas for optics. Thinking about the fall, do you have any ideas about building a culture for learning and whiteboarding in a virtual context? I'm working on that. I know our school uses Google. We are a Google district. And I know that Google has Google Meets. Um, so I can make little mini groups. I'm going to have to figure out how to get my students to use the whiteboarding feature on WebEx. Um, so we can use that. We can also use um, Google Docs as live documents where students, la I can still form groups and they can comment back and forth to each other. There's a website called Perusal. We'll see if we put a link on there where you can upload PDFs to that and it will assign student groups that students then can read through a section and ask each other questions based on the reading and they need to answer questions of each other and you can monitor what everyone is doing as well. All right, let's see here. Um, we have a number of questions about assessment. So how do you assess students when they're doing distance learning and is there a way to monitor students' activities and how they're doing their work? So because we are a Google school, I can use Google Forms and have my students do questions and answer questions on Google Forms and it will automatically grade for me as well. There are other sites, um, Edulastic is another one where you can make quizzes and assign them out remotely to students and they can turn things in. You can make a PDF document, type something up, save it as a PDF, um, and students can respond back. One of the nice things about Edulastic is they actually have a drawing tool and they can draw um, on the questions, which is really helpful for ray diagrams. Um, they can use their, their finger on the mouse pad to, to make drawings. Thank you. Um, there was another question actually about what's the name of the app that you use to create the diagrams that you showed us in the PowerPoint? Is that also using Edulastic? No, that one, my school, our math teachers have smart boards. I don't have one. I have chalkboards, like actual chalkboards, not whiteboards, but chalk. That's what I write with. Um, and it is called a smart notebook. Um, I can put a little picture on there as well. Um, so our school already had that. Before I used that, I just used um, Microsoft Publisher. Allows me to draw straight lines and those doodles on there. So I used Publisher before I used Smart Notebook. Great. Um, so this is a, a question from a high school physics and engineering teacher. Um, in general, distance learning has been tough to modify curriculum to fit an online instructional model and nearly impossible to hold live teaching sessions. Having a three-year-old daughter and a one-year-old son are the primary reason why I have such little time to prepare and post lessons online. My school has Google Classroom. Any tips or suggestions for how to work smarter, not harder, to still make instruction inquiry-based? This person has is familiar with modeling instruction, but not require hundreds of hours of prep each week. So some general uh, advice? So I am the only physics teacher at my school, but I'm not the only physics teacher in my district. And so three of us have been working together to kind of formulate and plan some stuff. And if we film something ahead of time, we share it with each other and we share um, we share lessons with each other. That's a huge part. Um, my oldest, thankfully, is a little bit older. My oldest is 20, but my youngest is 12, and I have a border collie. So my house is crazy. Right now, they're all bribed, and they're watching too much TV. But I try to set limits. I will be honest. Um, in the nine weeks we've been doing this, there has not been one day that I haven't had a headache. I'm exhausted, and I'm tired. So I've made extra time for myself. I have an alarm on my watch that goes off to remind me to get up and go and stretch and do stuff. And just, I think the hardest thing for most of us as teachers 
is to say, this is good enough. It's hard. We want it to be perfect. We want it to be right. And we want it to be the best that we can do because we're good educators and we're trying to do this. A lot of times it's going to be, that was good enough. It got the point across, okay. I'm gonna make notes just like I did my first year teaching. And if I have to do this again, it will be a little bit better. You've got some good advice for everybody right now <laughs> in education and also not, right? Um, okay, we have a couple more questions. Do you have um, do you have any particular advice for people about if they are not necessarily using technology? Um, yeah, what kinds of tools should they what 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 should what should they use in terms of um, selecting a platform? The question here is specifically, which tool is most useful for teaching and learning, Zoom or Google Classroom? Recognizing that those are different platforms that do different things, um, I think maybe a good question to answer if you have feedback on that specific question, but also in general, where do you start? Um, I think like many of us, the first week of, I was pretty sure we were going to go to some sort of remote learning before our district told us. Based on where everything was going, I was pretty sure, and I started looking at what my options were. And then that first week of remote learning, I got easily a dozen emails a day from my principal, from my student, my kids, teachers, and from my own students. And it was exhausting and it's overwhelming. Um, if you're already using a format, you keep using that format and see what else you can add. The problem with Google, I haven't used Google Meets yet. Um, so it's one of those, you're gonna have to try it out. So if your class, if your school uses Google, try Google Meets because you can keep your um, assigned groups and have working groups that way. Zoom has been wonderful um, and um, creating corporate accounts for free for educators right now during the pandemic so that we can meet with our students. Our school, and I had already looked at, at Zoom to see what I needed to do. Our school uses WebEx that is their particular one um, because it comes free with our phone software. But two-way communication has been rough. Um, most of my students, I'm gonna say 90% in any classroom that I do, doesn't have their camera on. And so I'm talking to a blank screen every single time. And it's exhausting. My AP2 students that I've had for two years, most of them have their cameras on and I can see them and we can talk and they actually use their, they unmute themselves and they actually talk to me. Um, otherwise, they use the chat function. They're much more comfortable with that, being able to use the chat. Um, Remind has been a great one for us as well because my students can text me um, to the Remind app we use and I can text them back individually as well. Great. And we're coming down on time here. Um, I have two major questions left. The first one is, do you have any recommendations for early childhood teachers? Um, I don't know if you have experience in that area, but if you were to include STEM and STEM education in early childhood, do you have any guidance? I have some links I will put in the chat right now as you speak. Well, that'd be awesome. I am a mother of four. Um, I didn't start teaching until five years ago, so I was home all the time with my kids. And they will tell you that when I talked to them, all they heard was science, 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 nerdy, 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 science, science, science. We just want them to touch things and do things. The shadow one's a great one where you can talk with them and you're like, hey, what do you notice about shadows? And you can move Paddington Bear forward and closer. All except the laser one, the um, reflection and refraction bed activity, all of those activities work with younger kids. Um, and the shadow one, you can then go out and do shadow tracing. And um, you can talk about shadow puppets. As long as they are engaged and they can see that this was a fun activity, later on we'll tie it back into science. But they wanna be engaged. They wanna have to think about things. They wanna be able to play. That's the most important thing for early education of playing with things. And then bringing with like the, the, the mirror lab and activity, you can set up a whole bunch of things and say, where do you see this guy? And kind of have them move down the mirror and see where they can see each of the objects that you've placed and lined up in front of the mirror. And that's enough. They need to be doing and they need to have some fun. And so you can just essentially take the idea of it for early education and find a way to play. How can you play with a mirror? 
stick a mirror in a thing of water at an angle and make a mirror off and make a rainbow from it. That's enough for them. Look at filling up a glass of water and putting a straw in it and saying, hey, look at, the, look at this from the side. The straw bent, isn't that crazy? It's magic or it's science. But looking at ways to just bring in those little activities to make them start wondering and thinking. That's what early education is really about. What do you notice? What do you wonder? Um, Danelle Hogan, see, I remember your last name, um, says that all the time. What do you wonder? What do you notice about this? And what do you wonder? And then ask them, get them to ask questions. That's the most important thing. Little kids love to ask why. This is the time to let them ask why. Excellent. Um, and then I also put some links in there for PEEP in the Big Wide World, which is available Good in one. English and in Spanish. Um, and I also put in um, FET simulations, also have some available for elementary. And some of those can also be appropriate for um, young learners, perhaps kindergarten, mm -hmm. maybe preschool with support from an adult. All right. Um, and then we will, Rebecca, along that lines, we should all, all, all make sure we put on at the end of my slide as well, a link to this amazing project. Amazing. Because they yeah, have there tons too. of early education ones on there. And I believe they also have um, many, if not all of their resources in Spanish because they are mm -hmm. in Arizona where we have many Spanish speakers. <laughs> Okay, um, let's see here. A couple more questions and then we'll call it, we'll close today. Um, how, do you sh how are you sure that when you get student feedback or student responses on assessments that it's actually their work? That is the nice thing about using a sharing document or have them type things up and share things on Google. Google has it tied to their email and Google has it tied, has a, um, and edit history. So if a student has copied everything from a friend, everything gets put in as highlighted as one single entry, that it was cut and paste. Um, there are, so that's the biggest one, being able to see the edit history off of Google. You can tell when things were entered and how they were entered. That's a big part. Um, so making sure that they log in and use their own emails um, and sharing documents with you to give you edit history allows you to see what they have been doing on their own. Okay. Um, all right. Um, let's see here. I think we've answered most of the questions. Um, we'll just do this will be the final, final one. Um, my concern is for students performing experiments wrongly and not getting expected results. For such students, how do you direct them to a correct path? That's what that class discussion is for afterwards. And I say, now, I know not everybody got this. Most of you should have gotten something like this. So that's why I want my students to email me beforehand what their results were and what they saw, because then I can point out good ones and say, hey, this is what something that most of you should have gotten something like this. And if you didn't, let's go through all of the process and steps to see what happened and then try it again. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. This has been a very informative webinar and um, you've taken us through the realities of what it's like to be um, a teacher, especially a STEM teacher, especially a high school teacher where you might have a lot of content and also a lot of processes that you need to cover throughout the year. So um, thank you so much to you. Thank you to uh, the rest of the team to help make this webinar possible. Um, like I think I mentioned at the beginning, you all receive an email within 24 hours notifying you that the recording has been uploaded. And if uh, you want to see it again, or if you want to see it with translation, YouTube will have an option where you can select the uh, subtitles in Spanish that are automatically generated. Um, we'll also include the slides from uh, that, that Lynn has on the website that will be in that email link. Um, in fact, I'll go ahead and put the slide up very quickly just so that you can see um, where to go. Let's see here. One moment. Reclaim host. So if you visit this website right here um, in English, oas.org slash en slash i10, that will take you um, to the page where you will see all of our future webinars as well as all of the webinars that have already occurred along with their presentations and such. Um, feel free to reach out. We're also looking for additional speakers. So I've already heard many requests 
um, for uh, other topics. If you happen to be somebody who has something to share, please let us know. All right, um, and lastly, thank you so much, Lynn. Uh, we really appreciate your effort and your time uh, in sharing your knowledge. I hope everybody has a wonderful evening and continues to stay safe. Thank you.